Greetings and welcome to The Farcast. I'm Alex Helmbrecht and I'm joined here today with Daniel Binkard. We are of College Relations. Our special guest today is Dr. Steve Coughlin, an associate professor in the Justice Studies, Social Sciences and English uh, department. Uh, uh, Dr. Coughlin, <clears throat> otherwise we'll probably just call him Steve since we're friends, uh, teaches primarily in the English department. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Arts in English from the University of Massachusetts in Boston, an MFA in creative writing with an emphasis in poetry from the University of Idaho, and then a PhD from Ohio University in English with an emphasis in creative writing. Uh, Steve, so thankful that you're able to join us today. Uh, the, the first question, how does one get from Massachusetts to Shattern? Because we don't have many Massachusetts folks around here. There's a couple people that work here uh, from Massachusetts. Yeah, In I guess fact, Rich Kenny. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's true. Rich Kenny he is, has the accent. Is, yeah. is from a town called Randolph, which is about one town over from where I grew up. So hey, and we talk about the same pizza restaurant, the Linwood, um, as our favorite pizza restaurant in all of America. Really? It's such mm -hmm. a small world. It really it's is. Unbelievable. No, we've, we've, Red Sox, we've talked Red Sox. We love the baseball. So, I mean, you could probably pose the same question to him. I don't know what oh, his journey. Do that, yeah. I don't know what his journey was. Uh, my journey was, um, so I went as an undergrad to University of Massachusetts at Boston. And then at 25, I decided to go to graduate school and I said, um, you know, I've always been someone who's more into traveling than, than, than maybe maybe the education portion of it. So I said, where's a place I would really love to live? And I've always wanted to live in Idaho, in the panhandle of Idaho. So that's how I ended up at Idaho. And then I ended up at Ohio University because there was a professor there, Mark Halliday, who I had kind of gotten to know a little bit. And he invited me to apply to his program, which I was like, okay. So I got to work with him, who was someone... Mark was one of the first poets I ever read whose work I really loved. So it was like, you, you get to work with someone... You know, that, 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 that someone whose work, you know, you read just to read in your early 20s, and then he all of a sudden invites you to kind of study with him. You're like, wow. You know, it's like you a made famous it. person. Yeah. Now, poets are not famous people, but it felt like I was with a famous person. Absolutely. Then I got to know him, and I realized he's very not famous. Uh, <laughs> I love Mark. Um, and then, so I ended up at Ohio University, and then I went on the job market. And in my field, it's very, very competitive. So I applied, you know along with my wife, you know, Tamara, we looked at all parts of the country. And one of the places I looked at was Shadron when I saw a job opening here. And I remember way back when, when I was like 21, 22, going on road trips. I love doing road trips. And I drove right by Shadron, Nebraska. And I was like, oh yeah. So I actually, you know, knew the area a little bit and I was excited to kind of come out here. And it's, we've been very happy ever since. That's great. Yeah. So you went up to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, that area? Coeur d'Alene, yeah. We're 90 miles south of Coeur d'Alene. Okay. You got it. I've been passing through there a few times. Coeur d'Alene's beautiful fantastic. country. I love it up there. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if I, you say it's like name a couple places that you would love to end up, uh, th that Coeur d'Alene area is one of them. It's gorgeous up there. Yeah, I it sure it. is. Yeah, we, we, had a, we had a great time. So how long have you been at, at CSC? When did you join the faculty? I am now in my sixth year. It feels like only yesterday. Yeah. I know. No, it really does. <laughs> yeah. I remember Alex in the parking lot my first summer. After I finished a year, I was in the, I was in the parking lot. And this is after um, I think my book had just, was just coming up and my first book. And I remember Alex coming up to me in the parking lot. I was driving this car. At, when I was a graduate student, I thought it was a really fancy car. As it turned out, a 12-year-old a, a Ford Focus is not that fancy. <laughs> but uh, I remember Alex waved me down and had me roll down my window and he introduced himself. Yeah. And, uh, and he said, he said, you like to write? And I said, yeah, I like to write. And Alex said, I think we can be friends. So, uh, <laughs> Paid off. Yeah. The rest is history. <laughs> yeah, right. Very nice. <laughs> you even had, you had a, no, you had a fusion. You had a focus, right? Yeah. Okay. I had a, yeah, I had a Ford yeah. Fusion. Ooh, and, uh, yeah. And both of us started having kids, and we got to trade them in. Oh, there you well, go. Well, I mean, the funny part about it is I traded in my Ford Focus, and um, a couple weeks later, I see a high school kid driving it around town. And I was like, I really probably was at a – thought I was at a different life stage than I really was driving <laughs> a Ford Focus. <laughs> it's kind of disheartening to see your old car still driving around yeah, town. Yeah, no, I thought, I, thought it, I thought it was done. The transmission I thought was gone, but – as it they, turned they out, continue. they fixed it. Yeah, yeah it's almost like a ending a relationship, you yeah. know, and then like seeing that individual having dinner with someone else. <laughs> oh, painful. <laughs> uh, so, Steve, let's talk about writing. When did you know you wanted to be a writer? Three years old? Six years old. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I never 
really, th- I still don't really think of myself as a writer. Um, I like to write. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, you know, to the, I, you know, the idea of being a writer, I don't know how I could, I'd have to be so much more serious in my day to day living, you know? Um, so, you know, writing is one of the things I do, but it's only one of the things I do. Um, but I'm passionate about it and I do it yeah. daily, but, um, I guess, let's see, I was in high school. No, I was in college. I, I was not, <laughs> I'm like, I'm the anti-professor in so many ways. Uh, I was not a big reader in high school and I certainly wasn't a big writer. I was a creative kid, but I wasn't um, just, you know, I grew up in a very working class town. We, I did really good at watching TV. And, uh, and then I went to college and I did think I was going to be a high school English teacher. But then I had a professor um, in a creative writing class that I signed up to because my older brother had taken this professor before and said, oh, you should take Lloyd Schwartz. So I did. And I took a class with Lloyd Schwartz, um, a well-known writer in the Boston area, a poet. Uh, he had actually won the Pulitzer Prize for literary criticism. No, for criticism. Hmm. Um, he is a critic of uh, classical music. Okay. And, uh, and Lloyd made me feel like my words mattered. And... Um, and I guess I started taking myself seriously as an artist, but I still never really thought of myself as a poet or a writer. And then I went to graduate school and I got my MFA in Idaho. And the person I studied with there, Robert Wrigley, he was someone who was a very serious writer, very serious poet too. And I think I started to kind of learn what it means to be a writer, what it means to be a poet from him. Um, so I, I definitely got that discipline and the, the understanding that if you want to be a writer, you can't talk about writing. You need to write. Um, a lot of people I know from graduate school who talk the most about writing did the least amount of writing. Um, and so, you know, I learned that discipline there. But again, you know, so, you know, in graduate school, I do three to five hours a day of writing um, on top of classes. And then you TA, so you'd be teaching too. Uh, but, you know, I took it very seriously and, and, and learned my craft a little bit. And, and here I am. So, so when did you know you wanted to teach creative writing? When Shadron hired me. Um, <laughs> that works. Good answer. Uh, no, I, I, again, I, 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 a lot of my writing friends that I met in graduate school were a lot, though they were my age, they were much further along the trail than me. Uh, like I said, I never really thought of myself any more than just whatever I was going to do that next hour, you know. And uh, so I met some friends, Joe Wilkins being one of them, who's a really, really well-regarded writer. He just came out with a book, a novel. He's a poet, memoirist, novelist. He's very successful, teaches at Linfield College in Oregon. And uh, he kind of, what, he, 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 he knew he wanted to be a, a writer and a professor. I knew I just wanted somewhere to be, um, which was graduate school at the time. And then I think through watching my, my friends and, and how they adopted a, a, a persona of a writer, of a poet, of a teacher. That's when I kind of said, okay, I see what their personas are. And I see I have that skill set too. And I think I kind of followed in their footsteps, quite honestly. Cool. Good history. So Steve, one of our uh, English program kind of traditions now over the last few years is the Story Catcher writing workshop. Yeah. And what do we got here? You're, you're involved with that. Are you in charge of that now? Oh, I hope I'm not. Um, <laughs> I haven't been doing much work it. on it if I have. <laughs> Break, uh, breaking news. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's how it often happens. You get put on committees you don't even know. <laughs> Next thing you know. Uh, so Dr. Matt Evertson, who teaches at CSC, his office is right next to mine. He's American lit. And I would say, like, I teach creative writing, but I also went to go get my PhD to teach literature. And I do get to teach a little bit here. But, uh, you know, I, I could have easily have gotten hired as a literature professor, you know, and I'd be very happy doing that, too. I'd still write poetry, but I'd be very happy doing that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so Matt, unfortunately, took all the literature classes from me. So I guess he gets his creative writing. But um, uh, Matt started Storycatcher um, um, Writing Retreat and Festival uh, about 10 years ago. And when I started here six years ago, right. um, Matt invited me to help with the, the, the story catcher uh, retreat. And I've been doing that ever since. So I, I think of myself as the number two. Okay. So for instance, me and Matt meet a couple months ago and we hosted out at Fort Robinson the last three or four years. People love it out at Fort Robinson. We do a three days there. You know, it's, it's in this beautiful setting. Um, we rent those barracks halls. So we all stay together. You know, it's really great stuff. Love it. 
Matt comes up to me the other day and he says, hey, what do you think of, of, of Fort Rob? You want to keep doing it at Fort Rob? I'm like, yeah, let's keep it at Fort Rob. Matt's yeah. like, okay. And then the next day Matt came in and said, hey, I just reserved Shadron State Park. That's where we're doing it from now on. So that's kind of the power <laughs> hey, I there you go. <laughs> in the story catcher realm. Uh, but Matt has done great, great work with that. And he does it through the Sandoz Society. We should definitely plug them. Uh, Marty Sandoz is a, a well-known writer of the region um, in the 20th century, uh, both a historian and, 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 a, and a writer of fiction. And there's a Mari Sando Society, Mari Hunt yeah. Sando's Heritage Society, uh, and they give us wonderful funding to do Storycatcher. And we bring in some seriously, seriously highly regarded writers, writers that have been finals for the Pulitzer Prize, writers that teach at some of the most prestigious writing programs in the country. So we've been so blessed and so lucky to work with them. And and Matt has, you know, he's, he's one of those can-do kind of people. He said, 10 years ago, hey, you know what would be a great idea? Let's do this thing. And now yeah. here's this thing. And this last year, we had our largest group participating. We actually had to turn people away, uh, so many attendees. So it's been a wonderful pleasure kind of kind of helping out with that. So who can be a, who can get involved with this? Uh, is it open to just English majors? or The, the original vision um, <clears throat> was to have it be – so Sandus was really uh, into um, – <clears throat> Into, in, into supporting young writers. And then, you know, part of the conversation that has to be like, who, who, who qualifies for a young writer? We originally wanted to be high school, yeah. uh, was my understanding. And certainly we had some high schoolers attend, but we found that we, you know, that more it was a thing that was, you know, people of the region, you know, all different age demographics kind of fit into the profile of who would want to go. So what started to happen is we said, okay, let's target, you know, the region, you know, uh, let folks know, you know, we live in a frontier and rural community. Um, there's limited opportunities sometimes to the arts. So like when we have these things, you know, people in their 20s, people in their 30s, you know, people who are retired, they want to take advantage of this. And that's another great thing about Storycatcher is a sense of community and, you know, people who necessarily wouldn't, in, you know, find a reason to spend three days together find that reason. And it, it really creates wonderful bonds. Um, so we also have targeted our college students. We've grown our creative writing program. That was one of the things they brought me in to do. So, you know, we now have 30, 40 creative writing minor students and, and those students are certainly invested in attending the workshop. So last year we had our largest group go, I think it was like 10, um, you know, so, you know, we certainly want to build that side of it, but we also want to make it as inclusive as it can be. So we want everyone who's in the, you know, the, the region, anyone who can hear this, you know, I don't care where you are, you're more than welcome to attend. It's very affordable. It's a wonderful sense of community. You'll get a lot of writing done and you'll get to work with some of the most respected writers in the country. What, what more can you ask for? Yeah, I, I can, here in Shadron. I know. Yeah. I can I can speak as, as an alum of the of yeah. the conference. I went a couple summers ago and I still communicate not frequently, but from time to time with a few of the writers I met there. And the main thing that I took away from it, because I had never gone to a, a writing workshop or a mm -hmm. festival, was how supportive it was. Uh, like you mentioned inclusive. I, I think people kind of have this idea that there's going to be these artsy fartsy types and they're not going to let you because you don't you conjugated a verb improperly <laughs> or something they're going to look down on you and there but there was no judgment at all it was very very helpful i encourage anyone who's interested in writing to attend it's a fantastic um you know uh, program that we run we're in the process right now of recruiting next year's writers and uh we're very excited about the potential of some of the people we can bring in. i can't say who yet because they haven't signed the dotted line but um but we're really excited i mean it just keeps getting bigger yeah um and and it really is it's just I mean, it's affirming. You go to it, it makes you feel good about people, about writing, yep. about the arts, um, about what it means to kind of get together and invest yourself, you know, in a community, you know, that's trying to do the same thing. So it's it's really wonderful. Plus June, as you well know, Daniel, June in this neck of the woods is it sure just is. the greatest month because I do it's have not some too hot. Breaking not... news, Alex. Storycatcher this year, according to Matt Evertson, has been moved to July. No, July. Yeah, we're in July now. Not only did we move to Shattered State Park, we're now in July. Well, retract that comment. July is cool. another wonderful month. <laughs> June's still great. <laughs> Not as good as July. July. You don't have to worry about snow in July. June, you're still yeah, kind of walking maybe. that line a little bit. You know? um, yeah, the way the weather's been going, it, it could oh, easily man. be the case. Certainly. <laughs> Steve, another one of those things that you kind of helped grow and, and, and nourish at CSC is the Distinguished Writers Series. Right. Um, uh, I believe the first one was... Uh, 
uh, the name's missing me, but uh, Kent Myers. Uh, yes, Kent Myers. I knew it began with a K. Yeah. Uh, and have brought authors in about once every semester yeah. to to read from their work, uh, and it's been really successful. Always really great turnouts, eighty to a hundred people there. A lot of students. Um, talk a little bit about that, uh, and and do you have someone this year? And if so, who will that be? We have Sarah Green coming in November. I think she's given a reading Thursday, November twenty first, uh, and that'll be free and open to the public at the Sando Society. Um, of course, by the time this podcast goes up, who knows if the time will have already passed. So, but anyway, this is 2019, by the way. Uh, what I would add, <laughs> what, I would, check. <laughs> what I would add is, um, yeah, we've had a wonderful, as you said, turnout in the, at those events and just wonderful support by CSC as an institution. Um, you know, my favorite, you know, every time it's my favorite, but my favorite moment of any of these was a couple years ago we had the poet frank x walker um came in and he came in through connections through my colleagues in the english in the english program uh, mary clay jones and marcus jones uh but anyways he was given a reading but i realized we were over 200 people and kurt kenbacher dr kenbacher comes up to me and says we're breaking the fire code and i was like we've done it yes yeah we've done it and then i Pretended I didn't hear him and walked away. But uh, now we have to actually pay attention to stuff like that. So the turnout's great. In creative writing, in the world of creative writing, there are programs. Um, MFA is the big program. About 10 or 15 years ago, that's you were seeing new MFA programs crop up everywhere. Now what's happened is we're seeing the newest trend is actually not in the growth of MFA programs. They've kind of plateaued. So they're still they're still doing quite well, but all the growth is happening in undergraduate creative writing programs. Creative writing majors have, are, are growing across the country. The amount of students that are taking these classes, enrolling these classes, again, these degrees is growing by the year. It's just a hot spot of, of intellectual activity. Um, so if you're going to have a good creative writing program, you have to bring in writers from around the country to work with students, meet with students, so they can see that this thing is happening actively that you are not just writing in this thing in a vacuum. You are a practitioner in something that is being practiced in cities and towns across this country. People are publishing their work, sharing their work, and we need to bring in some, some really reputable writers to kind of be role models and mentors to our young students here at CSC. Uh, so that's what we've tried to do. So we make sure to bring in these writers. A lot of them have established themselves, you know, have, have won multiple awards. Others are just like on the precipice. They've had their first or second book. They've won a couple smaller prizes. So, you know, we, we like to bring in all writers at different stages so that students can really get that opportunity to get to know what it means to be a writer and and to not think of it as when I was in college I thought of writing as this thing that could that you know that's absurd you can't be a writer you know that's the message I think a lot of our young people unfortunately get that's obviously not true you can be a writer there's a lot of different ways you can be a writer and you know we can talk about that you know in the classroom we could talk about that you know when we do our conferencing but you know one of the best ways to be a writer is to um engage consistently and to travel around the country and share your work with other people. So we show, you know, people are doing this. This is how people make our living. Our writers we bring in, we pay well because writers should be paid well. And there is money to be made. Sometimes you need to have it as a supplemental income or a supplemental job, but you can be a writer. Um, and, and, and that was one of the, I think one of the reasons I resisted ever calling myself a writer is because I was like, you can't do that. Um, but you can. And we see this time and time again when we bring in writers. And so the students can tangibly see the, the, the writers coming to campus. But another avenue you have for students to, to place their content is the 10th Street Miscellany, right? Of course, yeah. So again, a good writing program, you need to have different venues. Uh, one of those venues is you know 10th Street Miscellany. When I got here, uh, 10th Street Miscellany was kind of trying to trying to figure out how it wanted to exist. Um, so one of the things we did is we turned it into a student-run publication. Um, and we've actually added up, up the ante this year, uh, and now it's an internship opportunity. Um, so me and, and Mr. Jones, who's the other creative writer, a fiction writer in our program, kind of oversee it and to the best of our, our ability, kind of kind of offer insights. But, uh, you know, so 10th Street Miscellany does two things. One, it gives students an opportunity to publish their work, right? Um, it's, a, it's a journal of creative writing, but we have it's a journal of visual arts that they've opened it up to is, to that. And there, there is also opportunities to publish some critical work in there as well. So it's an opportunity for students to publish, publish as undergrads. If you're looking for graduate school, you want that on your resume, right? If you're looking to go off into teaching or other, 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 other professional lives, that looks great on a resume. Right. But the other professional aspect to 10th Street um, in terms of getting you professional experience is the other side of his editing. To run a journal um, requires a lot of skill, 
a lot of practice because you're going to have your successes and failures. So we, again, we allow students those opportunities. So when they graduate, if they want to go into the world of editing, publishing, they have experience now at it. Again, if you're going to yeah. run a good program, you can't just do great work in the classroom, which we do. You got to do great work beyond the classroom. Um, so that's making students feel like they're part of a writing community. That's doing open mic readings. That's doing 10th Street Miscellany. That's bringing in an active writing, writing series. That's having the summer story catcher retreat. It's all of these things go into creating a wonderful community so that students can thrive. That's great. So speaking of thriving, you've got two books written on poetry. Uh, so how long, how long do you spend writing a book of poetry? Well... Now we're getting to the nitty gritty of writing. Yeah. Right? Um, what's, the, how, what's your process? <laughs> 10,000 words a day. No. no, no, no. <laughs> all work and no play no. makes Steve and no. all day. Yeah. Uh, no, my, my process is to write every day. And that can take, that's various ways in which one writes. You know, someday my writing is I'm working on a poem. Some days I'm, you know, I'm not just a poet. I, I do, I, I've published a lot of creative nonfiction. I am somewhat working on a book of creative nonfiction. I'm working on a collection of short stories. So I've got, you know, about about a quarter, about a third of the way done on that. So I'm writing every day in these different genres. Uh, but beyond that, um, you know, sometimes I have to do, you know, students are like, Dr. Coughlin, I need you to write me a letter of recommendation. So I can, so sometimes I'll carve out, okay, my writing time today is two hours of writing, writing you know, these four letters of recommendation. So, you know, there's all these different ways I think of my writing life. Uh, but so... I think it's dangerous as a writer to say, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, if there's anything I've learned as a teacher and a practitioner of the craft is everything is process. Everything is, what am I doing today? How am I doing today? And you just keep building. So for me, it's one poem at a time, you know, and then at some point, every two to three years, you take a step back and say, what do I have here? And sometimes you have a book and sometimes you don't. Um, I'm lucky to work at CSC where we're a teaching school. So the emphasis of like, I, I've, if I was at a different institution, and you know, like UNL, I think to get tenure, they probably have to have two books. I guess I would have had tenure, okay. But they have to have two books by the time they go up for tenure. You know, at, at CSC, it's a little bit different. Um, so the pressure to publish isn't quite as intense, which actually is a huge benefit for me because that allows me to really put out the book I want to put out right? And to spend the time on it that I want to spend on it. So I, I really don't think of it as the end product. The end product's great. When you've got something published, you know, celebrate, enjoy. Yeah. But you've got to be married to the process. Everything's about process. And I think people who, who, who only want to share their work and be celebrated for their work, it's going to be a rough life. Because 99% of the time is getting up in the morning, drinking a cup of coffee, and feeling like you have nothing good to say. <laughs> That's where you start out. And then you put in the time, you get a couple lines down. Some days you get a lot of lines, some days you don't, right? But it's all about that process and understanding, okay, I'm gonna have my good days and my bad days, but if I believe in the process, good things will happen. Another thing that you're kind of involved with that I think would some may see as a process is running. I, I often see you <laughs> running on the, yeah. the trail south of campus. What uh, where did your dedicate where did your dedication for running come from? Um, fear of death. <laughs> That's a good motivator. <laughs> sure. Uh, no. Uh, well, I mean, sure, but I guess um, a couple things. One, my dad, who just I, I don't he doesn't, he would never want anyone to know his age, but I can he'll never listen to this. So. Uh, my dad just turned eighty five, and he's you know in so many ways he's been this iconic figure for me. So for a lot of young people, their their parents and their my dad in particular is just kind of this larger than life, both good and bad figure to me. Uh, but he was. I mean, the guy's tough as nails. He's the toughest human being I've ever met. And uh, he ran every day, you know, and his body would be beat up and he runs. So I, I kind of, I run partly just to kind of keep that connection with my dad, you know. And then um, I think part of me just loves the, running is awful. I, I mean, it's awful. <laughs> Anyone who likes riding, running is just beyond me. But I love the idea that it's just a mental toughness thing. You know what I mean? And I love the idea of, of just committing yourself to this thing and being mentally tough to complete it. Um, writing is the same thing. To say you're going to sit down to write for two or three hours, try to do it. It's tough. Uh, but if you commit yourself to it, good things will happen. Same thing with running. So I guess it's that idea of just like the, the I'm going to outlast you. I will do this every day. I will <laughs> not stop doing it. And we'll see what happens. Any favorite running spots? 
I like running behind the hills here. Um, but right now, I, in fairness, Alex, it's been a month. I've, I've been taking off partly because there's just there's no time. There's just no time. Uh, we have a little one at home. I'm writing. I'm teaching. But I will definitely get back at it. But um, I like running behind the school. One of the things I don't like about running, living in Shattered, it's a small town. So everyone comes up to me and says, hey, I saw you out running. Yeah. And I don't yeah. necessarily want that attention. Um, so, you know, I try to find places where I can hide a little bit. But there's no hiding in Shattered, Nebraska. No. That's why it'll be so nice when the Cowboy Trail is finished. Oh, I can't yeah. wait. Yeah, yeah. it'll be awesome. It will be. I should go up to a state park and run up there, but I'm too lazy to drive. Up there. <laughs> That's the hard part, that 10-minute drive out, because that uh, Black Hills Overlook Trail oh, is, even perfect, after the yeah. 2012 fire, yeah. I, I, I still love going out oh, there. Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Beautiful. So, Steve, let's talk about movies. Oh. And I, I, I think you had mentioned this to me and then I'd forgotten, but uh, watching movies from Roger Ebert's Greatest Films List. Wow. How far along are you on that? That's great conversation. So um, probably not very far. We had a baby about a year and a half ago. And what I realized yeah, that, that is can happen, yeah. is that um, <laughs> now what I have time for is about twenty minutes of the fluffiest TV that I can watch on Netflix. Not that I don't think this is a great show, but like what I watch these days is called The Great British Baking Show. <laughs> it's a great show. I really love it. But I don't have any mental capacity for, for anything beyond that. I did start the new Breaking Bad movie, but that's not a Roger Ebert film. So I guess I haven't been getting as far on it as I'd like. But it is something that 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 I, I love to make my way through. Uh, I always loved Ebert, you know. He was a, he was a great spirit. Yeah. And then, you know, when he, was, when he was going through his last days, the way he... He kind of embraced his life and embraced his death. I think yeah. you know some powerful, powerful stuff there. Great critic too. Uh, where I, you know when I grew up, and I think a lot of us are like this, right? Um, it was either or logic, right? Either you loved America or you liked Russia. You know what I mean? Like, or either you liked McDonald's or you liked Burger King. Either you drank Pepsi or you drank Coke. Um, so either you liked Siskel or you liked Ebert. And I was an Ebert guy. Yeah. 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 Had a, you know, I can remember reading his blog toward the end of his oh, life. Yeah, his blog had a very really lovely good. relationship oh, yeah. with his wife, yeah. too. I, yeah. I, you know, he couldn't eat toward the end, but he cooked. Mm -hmm. And he said it was the, the central pleasure of just the smell of it, you know, of just putting it together yeah. brought him such pleasure. Yeah. Pretty he kept guy. up the reviews right up to the yeah. end, didn't he? Yeah. 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 What were some of the standout movies that you've seen, uh, uh, whether or not they're on the list? But uh, normally we ask you about favorite movies, but it's not on our quick questions this time. Oh, so, okay. So let's you – know, just a couple titles off the top of your head that you've – Well, you know, I, I love – I love um, – I love film. You know, I think if, you know, things had gone a different way, I probably would have gone into filmmaking. Um, you know, so I always think, you know, <laughs> I, it's like you never see it when you're in it. Like when I was 18, I just didn't know that the path I was on was this. But now in retrospect, I was like, of course, this is, you know, I was going to yeah. go down this path. But I was like, I was like, what 19 year old is watching The Last Tango in Paris? You know what I mean? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but that's what I was doing. So like the, the, the films, but I always loved the, the noir films. You know, The Big Sleep was always like one of my oh, favorite, yeah. favorite films. Um, I always kind of liked, you know, early on, you know, those Westerns, um, the, the, the Sergio Leone Westerns, yeah. the spaghetti Westerns. I was talking a lot about Clint Eastwood yesterday in one of my classes. Um, we just got on a tangent a little bit and, you know, I was thinking of, you know, um, Unforgiven. I remember watching that and being oh, yeah. really profoundly impacted by that. Now there's, there's, you know, I could go on, but I, I think for me, the genres I always kind of went to are noir and I still love noir. Um, in Western, I love that genre. And then, of course, you know, realism is something that I've always, you know, that that's kind of, you know, I think, you, you know, you go into writing, you, you probably like a lot of realism. So uh, I, I definitely, you know, Martin Scorsese films, the early films was, were hugely impactful on me as a kid. Um, for John Ford, I liked a lot. Um, yeah, film is, film is still, I, you know, if you, you know, I love writing, I love literature, I love music, but Film's pretty great. It's special. Yeah, yeah it it's, is. It's there a fun is. way to spend a couple hours for sure. It is. And, you know, you, I always love what Steven Spielberg said, you know, if you really want to study film, turn the volume down and watch the movie. You know, that's interesting. Yeah. Turn the volume. You can start to see, you know, not just how it's edited, not just how it's shot, but every, every scene. Um, so um, Roger Ebert taught a class at University of Chicago, right? Um, Chicago University. Chicago University. University of Chicago. Anyway, he was teaching a class there. In and, Chicago. In Chicago. <laughs> and, uh, and he taught on Pulp Fiction a entire semester, and he just did shot by shot. Every class, was a, they studied a different shot. 
It's another great film, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That was one of the, when I was in high school, that was like the film was Pulp Fiction. It was. The first time I thought it, I thought they messed up the reels and were shooting it, showing it out of order, though, and I was really upset. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, that's a nice writing trick. <laughs> right. Um, Steve, outside of work, uh, what are some of your interests? I know you're a huge fan of the New England Patriots from hanging out with you. Uh, I remember watching a divisional playoff game with you, and I was <laughs> told Dude, to go outside because I was bad luck. That was the other that team. Was my, my family. <laughs> the other team scored a not touchdown. Like that you were there. <laughs> but uh, in addition to the the Patriots, what are what are because that's like you're birthed in that. I mean, you that, are as sports culture, right? In sports culture, like, like for instance, I keep saying when the Patriots aren't good anymore, I don't have enough hours in my life to dedicate to watching sports, right? But so I, maybe I'll back off them. But like they're so good right now, I have to keep watching. But like. But when I was a kid, the Patriots were like 1 in 15. They were terrible. And I still watched all those games. And I remember listening at home when the Patriots were at home on the radio because they were so bad they wouldn't sell out. So you'd have to listen to them on the radio. They'd black out the games. And I, you know, I remember me and my mom sitting in the living room of our house, you know, listening to the Patriots. So fast forward, this team that has just gone on this run of, of, of real dominance. But, it, you know, it, the dominance is great. Don't get me wrong. We enjoy that. But it's about family. It's about community. You know, I live far away from home. I miss my home. I miss my family. I miss my community. And it's through sports that we access those things, right? You know, I, I, so I think of my love of sports. Like what I love is I'll be watching this Monday night. I'll watch the Patriots. Or is it Sunday night? They play a night game against the Ravens. Is it Sunday or Monday? I think it's Sunday. Sunday, yeah. And I'll watch the game, and I'll have my phone next to me. And at one point, my brother will text me, who lives in Napa, California. He'll say, you watching? And I'll say, oh, yeah. And then we'll be texting back and forth. You know, so that's just, that's the beauty of sports, right? And, yeah. Uh, so I, I love I love sports. I love the Celtics. I love the Red Sox, you know. But that's regionalism. It's one of the last places that regionalism still really is, is, is prevalent, you know, um, in sport culture. So... Let's see. So yeah, sports, music, film. <laughs> you you kind of listed all the things. Yeah. I like to exercise, but I don't even do that that much anymore. I like to write. You know, I love spending time. You know, my best friend is my wife. You know, so we we definitely spend a lot of time watching our movies and watching. You know, listening to music and and um, you know, I I don't. I mean, I'd like to travel more. I used to be a huge road tripper. I think I've driven cross country 30, 40 times. Wow. Um, been to all U.S. continental states. Been to really every corner of the country, with the exception of the Everglades. And um, you know, so I love to travel. You know, next step I think would be traveling overseas a little bit more. Um, but you know, that'll have to wait for a few years too. Yeah, it's tough with the little ones. When... <laughs> it's the pluses and minuses, yeah, for right? For sure. You know? For sure. So I think we're on to our quick hitting questions okay. to wrap things up. Okay. So, who has the better accent, Nebraska or Boston? It's a great question. <laughs> I'm very loyal. Um, yeah. Very very loyal. So I would I would definitely say, of course, the Boston accent, which isn't really an accent at all. But is it um, more of a way of life? Or yeah. a <laughs> Um, I don't think it gets categorized as an accent. I'm trying to think of what it would get categorized, but it's not technically an accent. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, oh, I, I was watching a video when I was back home last of, um, I used to be in these plays like in, in elementary school. So like when I was in fourth grade and I had the thickest little accent, it was so cute. <laughs> like I was like, cock, pock, you know, all that, all those things, you know, and it was just, and then, you know. I, I move away and you lose it a little bit. Sometimes when I get really excited when I teach, it comes out. It's kind of fun, actually. Yeah. yeah. First concert you attended? R.E.M. on the Monster Tour. Nice. I, just, uh, I yeah. saw that it's their 25th anniversary of that album today. Can you believe it? You know, it's yeah. funny. So the album Monster, which I actually – so I have another collection of poetry that I'm kind of sitting on right now that I just finished, and I called it Deep Cuts. And uh, at least that's the working title right now. But the title poem – the title of the collection is after this poem called Deep Cuts, which is um, about my my love of R.E.M. and about how um, when the album Monster came out, this is when MTV was still, I don't know if it's bigger now or not, but I remember they played music videos. This is bef before the reality shows. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Right. right around the cusp, right? Okay. And what's the frequency, Kenneth? The first single off the album came out, Michael Stipe, when they cut to his head. Because it starts out just shooting him below the waist. And it cuts to his head. He's the lead singer of R.E.M. And he had shaved his head. So I went out the next day and shaved my head. Oh. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, I had bad skin. I was skinny as a rail. It could not have made me look any worse. <laughs> but I had the shaved head. Um, 
And that was kind of, I'm a very loyal guy, I guess. Uh, and that poem kind of talks about, you know, just like what you will do when you are obsessed with something, right? You know? Yeah. I saw a photo of him a while ago, and he has a long, like, David Letterman Rip Van Winkle beard. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and a pierced nose, like a, like yeah, a barbell that I goes through that. his nose. <laughs> so I'm glad you, you haven't done that the yet. Favorite, the my favorite uh, comment on that, if you're where I read it, was someone said, he looks like a, f- a homeless Father Christmas. <laughs> uh, he shaved that. Oh, he did? And okay. he did that. Oh. That was, he, he grew his, he didn't shave for two years after his dad died. Oh, so that's grieving. what it's for. That's part grieving, yeah. Hmm. How about that? If Shadron State College wasn't the name of this place, what would you call it? I don't know about Shadron State College if I change the name, but I do not like Eagles. I'm not a fan of Eagles. It seems kind of like a generic name. I always tell my students I'd like to come up with something new. My pitch to my students, though we're about 90 miles wrong, is I want to be called Prairie Dogs because I love Prairie Dogs. And then we could call the stadium the House of Plague because Prairie Dogs have Plague, right? <laughs> now, now, who wants to go to the House of Plague to play a football? You know what I mean? Sounds right? like a play on the yeah, House and then of the, Pain. In yeah. the stadium, we can make like sounds or something. I don't know what they make, the Prairie Dogs, but we can make like Prairie dog sounds. That freaks people uh, out, man. Immediately thinking of the potholes and somebody breaks their ankles. <laughs> and I don't... Because uh, Aaron Field has done a Graves lecture on this, and it was one of those. It's an iffy topic when you're talking about prairie dogs yep. and horses breaking their legs. But, Ooh, but uh, it is. Well, it depends yeah. where. You, uh, look, my wife Tamara really. We had to have a conversation because she wanted to adopt a prairie dog. <laughs> uh, aren't they? Aren't the pelts sold in the big cities <laughs> back east? Uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. They are darn cute, though. They really are. And they, they, yeah. you drive by them, and they're facing. They're so cute. We were at Devil Devil's Tower a few years ago, and there were more people, tourists, taking pictures oh, of bet, the yeah. prairie dog yeah. than they were of, of Devil's Tower There's itself. Something about it, those it's just dogs. different. Yeah, and coming from that. I've got that perspective now of that they are kind of a keystone species. So ah, it's like that. Yeah. I can't think of them as a pest. Yeah. And I know a lot of people do. Uh, all well and good. But yeah. They're cute. Th- they're, there, there could be a nobility to having the mascot as the prairie dog. I yeah. think. I would like to take that on. I don't think the eagles are doing much for us as a, as a name. Am I right? Am I the only one that doesn't like that mascot? Well, the, the reason it's the, – or the story goes in the early 20s, uh, a student named Clinton Smith, or he was in high school or something, but he was involved with Shatter and, and Shatter and State, really loved the football team. And he had – he found an abandoned eagle and adopted it. And would bring it to football games. And so then they started to call where the, where the football team played the home of the Eagle. And so I think legend has it that that Eagle is actually at the Dawes County Historical Museum. Um, I don't if remember only we seeing went it. went to the museum. I've never been there. Oh, you should check yeah, it out. I definitely. It's, a, there, yeah. it's worth a visit for yeah. sure. Um, but I don't remember seeing it there when I went. And I've so, been there once and I, I can't remember. But that, that's where the name Eagles came from. So, you know, uh-huh. it, it, yeah, it does seem generic, but it, there is a story. There's a nice it. story to it. Yeah. Yeah. Steve, how many times have you been to the top of Sea Hill? Many. I don't even know. A lot, right? During your runs. Well, I don't always get up there on my runs. I like to walk a lot, too. Um, that's another reason why I love CSC. Like, in the nice weather, like, as a teacher, if I need to take a half-hour break, I go out and hike in those hills back there. Oh, what a great thing to do. So I'll hike up there. Probably many times, Alex. I would say over 20. Oh, nice. Over Good 30? Deal. I don't know. 40? I don't know. Well, in a six-year period, that's not too bad. No, yeah. I mean, I should get up there more, and I feel like I should go there right now. Feeling it's kind of windy out, though. Right now. Yeah, what well, bundle I'm also kind of wimpy. <laughs> <laughs> Best time to go up there when the weather's bad. Right, yeah. right, right, yeah. So here's a dangerous question. Uh, what's one of your favorite books? Um, Good question. We don't say absolutes. Yeah, absolutes <laughs> are dangerous. Even one of my favorites. I get excited about things. Yeah. So, like, I'll get into something for a while. So I always tell my students when I was their age – you know, it's when I started reading the poet Walt Whitman, you know, and Walt Whitman influenced me in a lot of ways as a writer and a thinker. Um, and then, you know, after him, I love this guy named Edward Abbey, who is the writer of the Southwest, kind of one of the first environmentalists of the Southwest. Um, and I got really into him. Um, so, you know, I go in these waves. These you know, I get really excited. Um, so let me think, who am I really into right now? Well, I'm into Mark Strand, the poet. I was just teaching Mark Strand, a uh, collection called Blizzard of One, teaching an advanced creative writing class. And I was like, all right, I got to give them one, my students, one book that's going to really challenge them. I know they won't like it, but, you know, it's going to show them different ways that a poem can be or exist. So Mark Strand is a very strange poet. 
<laughs> kind of a little bit funny, a little esoteric sometimes, or you know, you have to spend some time thinking about these poems, kind of philosophical. Uh, and of course, I'm like, well, I'll just have to do the best I can in persevere, and I teach it. And of course, the students say, this is our favorite book of the semester. So, you know, what do you <laughs> nice. know, right? So I'm into Mark Strand right now. Um, I have always loved Denise Duhamel, who's a poet who's writes in the style called ultra talk. So everyone, when you're being taught how to write poetry, it's like, you've got to make this lyrical type thing. Denise Duhamel's like, let's put as many words into this poem as I can. And I was like, it liberates the voice, I think. So I love her voice. Uh, Tracy K. Smith, um, Life on Mars, David Bowie song. Uh, I'm going to be teaching in a couple weeks. I'm excited about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I get, I get really, you know, it's I, what I love about teaching is, is I'll choose my books for teaching. And I go back and reread them, and I get kind of energized again about the about the work. Oh, yeah. So that's where I'm at right now. Well, Steve, we we have a couple minutes. Okay, would you share a poem with us? Yeah, I can share. A poem. We've been, been so, showing your books. They've been the so time. handsomely yeah. displayed yeah. here on this. Well, I mean, well, I don't know if we have to. I mean, you told me to bring a poem. That I had recently written, or yeah, if you if you had a new one you wanted to share, or it, whatever, your the, the mic is yours. Yeah, the mic is mine. Yeah. Um, so I'll bring. How about one that I don't think I've ever read? Does that work to an audience? That'd be perfect. Well, I, I was just in my exclusive. office earlier today, and I was <laughs> kind of going through the collection I'm working on right now, right, and looking at the different poems and taking poems out, putting poems in, taking the same poems out, putting the same poems in. Like, That's Does how this work goes. now? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's always like, nah, it still doesn't work. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a poem I wrote about a, a, a direct address poem to Northwest Nebraska, which is where we live. Perfect. Um, it's. Have you ever heard of the poet? Have you ever heard of the poet Frank O'Hara? Yes. <laughs> No. no. Frank O'Hara <laughs> was a poet of the middle of the 20th century. Um, he lived in New York City. He was known as what they part of this group of poets. Sometimes they, they put groups of poets together and call them a school, even though they're all doing different kind of things just because they're in the same time and space. Sure. You know? So he's part of this group of poets called the New York School. And they were a little bit into the avant-garde, and there's certainly some similarities there. But, but Frank O'Hara was his own poet in many ways. So he has a poem. He wrote a series of poems. A lot of his poems he referred to as the I do this poems, I do that poems, meaning I don't want to write a poem about love and death today. I simply want to write a poem about I went out for a bagel and then got on the subway and then got a really nice cup of coffee and I love looking at art. You know what I mean? So like oh, I do yeah. this, I do that, I do this, I do that. And um, so one of the poems he has, it's a very famous poem, is called Steps. And it's actually kind of a love poem, but it's also a love poem to New York City. I love this, you know, I love that, I love that, you know, and that we get to do all of this in New York City. So it's called Steps. So I tried to write my version of Steps, which I called Strides. Seeing how where we live out in Northwest Nebraska, there's a little more space. So I called it Strides. That makes sense. Um, and so this is his, you know, so it's kind of like a direct address poem to, to, um, to Northwest Nebraska, but it's also kind of riffing on the poem Steps. So you got to know that poem, which you don't know, but that's all right. Um, so the opening line, or the, I forget what the exact, how, un, how how unpredictably pleasant you are today, New York, or something like that, is the opening line to uh, to Steps. So, of course, I stole that and said, how unpleasantly pleasant, how unpredictably pleasant you are today, Northwest Nebraska. Right? Okay. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Strides. Oh, it's also a John Wayne poem. Okay. Okay. All right. Strides. How unpredictably pleasant you are today, Northwest Nebraska. Like tough guy John Wayne singing Red Wing in The Shootist. Here I am bundled in my Calvin Klein winter coat prepared for your late March bluster. And there you are, more appealing than Jane Russell's revealing Bodice in The Outlaw. How can I not adore your miles of empty grassland, your badlands rugged as a John Ford film? I could walk for weeks in your dry creeks without encountering a single Walmart reader. Did you know of the years I lived in the eastern city? The nights I circled the same block of tenements, radio broken, unable to find a parking space? How could I not indulge in your nothingness? The idea of riding horseback with John Wayne, tall in the saddle, masculinity flowing like whiskey. To hell with watching Once Upon a Time in the West. Just me and John Wayne and you, Northwest Nebraska, my home on the edge of the West. Our silence impressive as any of your wind-worn buttes. Still, for lunch, 
Instead of John Wayne offering me another hardtack biscuit, wouldn't it be better if hidden in one of your wavy hills was a Cracker Barrel restaurant? Wouldn't it be preferable for me and the Duke to tie our horses to a hitching post and recline in rocking chairs to eat the big boy country breakfast? And after my third cup of coffee, it's back to your endless prairie. Repetitive, really, as searching for a parking space. So, after another hour, why not surprise me with a tumbleweed-blowing swinging door saloon Wild West Town featuring a newly constructed Barnes & Noble? Instead of actually experiencing your sandhills, let Wither Cather sing their brilliance. And when John Wayne says, Pilgrim, we're burning daylight, then, Northwest Nebraska, I will jingle jangle back into you. How I will look upon the distant shadows of Crow Butte so wild and long. How I will feel compelled to bound across you with giant strides. And after John Wayne and I check into our room at the Best Western, oh God, Northwest Nebraska, how wonderful it will be for the both of us to unwind in our separate queen-size beds, a newly purchased 10-gallon hat on my head, and watch an early evening double feature of my darling Clementine in the Oxbow Incident, or maybe the Wild Bunch in the Gunfighter, or perhaps High Noon in a Fistful of Dollars as we drink too much whiskey and smoke too many cigarillos and marvel as if by firelight about everything we love about the West. That was great, Steve. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, yes. And uh, thank you for sharing strides, for, for sharing... Uh, your thoughts on CSC, why you're here, and what you like to do. I hadn't read that poem several years. I kind of liked it. I kind of that was great. It. Yeah, yeah, you read it really well. Yeah, thanks. Sure thanks for joining us today. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me. Um, and I really appreciate the work you all do. And, and we are we are so lucky at CSC to have such a great amount as faculty members. There's just a great amount of staff that just support and make everything that happens here at CSC work and function and not only that you make us an institution that i think really matters you know our students come here they don't just have great learning experiences they have great on-campus experiences it's because of things like this so keep up the good work thank I you appreciate it mm -hmm.